This morning, we're in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And starting last week and continuing for about five weeks until ministry conference, we're going to look at some of the things that Jesus said about coming, about why he came, and about how we can come to him. Last week, we talked about Jesus' invitation to come and rest. Come and rest. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. This morning we're looking at Matthew chapter 9 and we're looking at why Jesus came and the invitation that he gives to us to join him in his purposes. So let's look at Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 9 through verse 13, and then we will skip to verse 35. Matthew 9, 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's skip to verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This whole chapter is full of Jesus encountering people who have a specific need. The first little story at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus forgives the sins of a paralytic, of a man who's lying on a mat, and everybody goes, ah, you can't do that. And he goes, well, if I, can, if I can do this, then for sure I can do that. And so he heals him, and the man gets up and walks. And everyone marvels. And then Jesus comes by Matthew's tax collector booth, And even though you and I look at this story and we go, there's no healing in that story, but there is. But there is. Matthew is sitting in his tax collector booth, disconnected, outcast from his society, working literally for the enemy oppressor. He is a traitor on every level. He is a man in need of redemption. And what does Jesus say to him? Does he stop and say, you shouldn't be a tax collector, and here are the reasons why. Does he shame him? Does he condemn him? Does he judge him? No, what does he say to him? Follow me. Follow me. Then John's disciples come and they say, hey, we fast and you don't fast. How come you don't fast? Jesus says, hey, I'm here. I'm the bridegroom. You can't fast during the wedding. (laughs) Later, when the bridegroom is gone, then my disciples will fast. John's disciples were in need of some celebration. And then Jesus heals a dead girl and a sick woman. And then he heals a blind and a mute. And then we come to this passage that says, Jesus looked at everyone he came in contact with. He looked at the crowd. He looked at the people that he saw every day, and he had compassion on them. That word compassion is, uh, it's a Greek word. It's a fun word to say. It's splanknitzomai. It's kind of a fun word. But it means literally his guts were twisted within him. Have you ever looked at somebody and had gut twisting compassion for their situation. I know as a mom, sometimes I have that with my kids. 
something happens, either they fall and hurt themselves or they're in a tough social situation, and I feel gut-twisting compassion for them because I don't want them to hurt, and when they hurt, I hurt. That's what Jesus felt when he looked at the people around him. He looked at them and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost. They were in danger. They had gone astray. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Every person Jesus met was a person with a need. Every person that Jesus met was a person who was in need of healing, who was in need of redemption, who was in need of guidance, who was in need of a shepherd to protect them and to guide them. And Jesus invited his disciples to be part of the solution. He invited them to be part of the solution because the workers were few. The workers were few. Let's go back to this story about Matthew and look at it a little more in depth. Jesus is walking through town and he sees Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. I think it's very telling that in this book called Matthew, we don't get a lot of biography about Matthew. It doesn't tell us, well, Matthew was born in a small village and he had a hard time growing up and, you know, his, his mom was, uh, was an absent mother and his father, like, was very screamy and abusive and he felt ostracized from his community because they didn't help him. And so when he grew up, he became a tax collector for the Romans. That doesn't tell us that. It just says, Matthew was sitting at a tax collector's booth. Literally all we know about him is, according to this culture and tradition, he's a big, fat traitor. That's all we know about him. We don't know if he had a wife and kids. We don't know if he had a mom. We don't, we don't know anything. We just know that he was on the wrong side of his people. He was on the wrong side of his people, sitting at a tax collector's booth. And that's all we get to know about Matthew before we hear Jesus say to him, follow me. I think it's really interesting <laughs> because we all have a tendency to do this. It's just a human thing. We have a tendency to look at people and put them in a category. It's part of our survival instinct. We need to be able to decide who's a friend and who's a foe quickly. Got to be able to decide who's going to help us and who's going to hurt us so that we can go with the helper and not the herder. All we know about Matthew is that he falls into that other category, that category of sinner, that category of someone who's out to hurt his own people. Now, Jesus knew more than that. Jesus could see his heart, but his disciples who were with him couldn't. And can you imagine the whispered conversation? What is he doing? He can't call that guy. He can't ask him to follow him. He can't be one of us. Don't they know that he's a big traitor to his people? Jesus said, follow me. He didn't give an explanation. He didn't say, hey guys, here's what our plan is now. We're going to start talking to sinners. He just did it. He just did it in front of them. Follow me, Matthew. And Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. What? It's one thing for Jesus to say, leave all of that behind and follow me. It's another thing for Jesus to go, sit in this man's house and eat at dinner with him. Sit in this man's house with all of his tax collector friends. All of his sinner friends. That was crossing a line. It was crossing a line. When the Pharisees saw this, they said, Whoa, -ho -ho. why are you eating with tax collectors? Read, traitors to our people and sinners. Read, anybody who will pollute you just by being around them. 
Why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said, it's why I came. It's why I came. Jesus came to bring restoration and redemption and healing and forgiveness. You can't do that for people who are already restored and healed and healthy. He said, it's not the, doc- it's not the sick, I mean, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. It's not the found who need a trail guide, it's the lost. It's not the person who has their life together who needs Jesus the most. It's the one who's sick. It's the one who is a sinner. So I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I think that it's very interesting then at the end of this chapter where we're dealing with sin and brokenness and breaking the rules and going against social convention, that it talks about how Jesus saw the world around him. In those verses, it says, Jesus went town to town, village to village, teaching in the synagogue, healing the sick, spreading the good news of the kingdom. And when he saw the people, he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. Was it because they were good guys who were under oppression? Probably a little bit. But I think it's because they were people who were sinners. They were people who were broken. They were people who were in need of healing, both physical healing and spiritual healing. And he looked at them not with disgust, but with compassion. It bothered him, but it didn't make him angry. It made his guts twist inside him with pain, shared pain for what sin was doing in their lives. And Jesus didn't just stop there. He asked his disciples to look. He said, look. (laughs) Open your eyes. Look around you. Look around you. The harvest is plentiful. Look around you. Look at all of these people who are in need. Look around you. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus didn't just say, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are are few, so get to work. Get, Get on out there. Get your sickle. Get going. He said, pray. He said, pray that God will do the sending. Pray that God will send workers into his harvest field because there are people that surround us who are in desperate need of some good news. That was Jesus to his disciples 2,000 years ago. But it's the same, isn't it? It's the same for you and for me. I don't go anywhere without hearing somebody, regardless of what their viewpoint is, somebody talking about how bad things are. Whether they're talking about the decline in church attendance, whether they're talking about um, things that government officials are doing, whether they're talking about cultural changes, whether they're talking about our society in general. Regardless of their political or religious affiliation, Everybody's talking about how bad it is. Everybody. It's time for the church to open our eyes, to look around us, to see what Jesus saw, to see the people around us harassed and helpless. Harassed and helpless. It's time for us to see sinners, and instead of saying, sinner, having the love of God move us to compassion for the destruction that that sin is bringing to their life. That's why sin is sin. 
Sin isn't sin because God woke up one morning and said, hmm, I think we'll make this good and that bad. And this good and that bad. Oh, and that and that. Oh, and definitely that. Sin is bad because it brings destruction on God's good creation. Whether it is in our lives, the lives of others, it brings death and destruction. That's why sin is sin. Not because it's on a list, but because of the effect that it has on our lives, on our families, on our communities, on our world. That's why when Jesus looked out, he didn't go, Oh, those people, they don't deserve to hear from me. You can't find it. Find it for me. Where Jesus said, nope, they don't deserve it. Nope, not going to that village. Definitely not stepping across that line. Never. Not once. Not once did someone try to come to Jesus and Jesus said, you are not worthy of my time. Not once. Not once. And we know from Ecclesiastes that there's nothing new under the sun. So if you think we've got bad sinners today, you can trust that there were bad sinners at Jesus' time too. Matthew was one of them. Sold out his people to line his pockets. And Jesus didn't wait for him to come and say, can I follow you? Jesus walked by his tax collector booth while he was still where? In sin, still what? Cheating his people, still what? Making dishonest gain. And he said to him, Matthew, come follow me. That's not for you. Come follow me. Come, follow me. Jesus looks out at the world with compassion. And he said he came for the purpose of calling sinners. He healed their diseases. He healed their sickness. He knew they needed a shepherd. And he said, come. Come, follow me. Come. And when his disciples followed him, he said, Come follow me and also come to call sinners. When he first called his disciples, he said, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What kind of men? Holy men? Righteous people? Good guys? Fishers? of sinners. Jesus calls us to follow him, but he calls us to follow him in calling sinners to follow him. I think Jesus looks at our world today with so much wrong, so much hurting, so much need, so many lost and alone. He looks on our world with compassion. Jesus doesn't look on them with condemnation. He looks on them with a desire to bring restoration. Jesus looks on those who desperately need a savior. And do you think, do you think he recognizes that need and gives of himself his love, his guidance, his shepherding? Or do you think that today in our world, Jesus somehow has a different response? Do you think that sinners in our time are so much worse that Jesus would say to them, you're not worthy? I don't think so. I think Jesus looks on the sinners in our day, including you and me, including you and me, with compassion and says, my love and my shepherding, my guidance and my saving power are what you need. Do you think that Jesus wants us to be disgusted and outraged at the sin and the world around us? Or or do you think that Jesus might be calling us to love 
the broken sinners in our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our world. Jesus tells his disciples that the harvest is ripe and it's time to send workers into the field. I say to you this morning, open your eyes and look around you. Open your eyes and look around you and see the people that God loves, that Jesus died for, that God ascribes infinite worth to, worth his own life. Look at those people and ask God to send workers into his harvest field. Ask God to move you into your place in that harvest field. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but God knows how he wants to use you in his harvest field. People are hurting. They're harassed and helpless without a shepherd. They need the joy that we have and the hope that we hold in our hearts. They need it. And we've got it. We need to pray. We need to pray that God will help us not to sit back and judge them for being lost, but to love them enough to eat with them, to spend time with them, to befriend them, and to love them to Jesus. That's our job. What would it look like if we loved people around us like Jesus loved? Can you picture it? What would it look like? To reach out to your neighbors with the love of Jesus. What would it look like to put judgment on the back burner in exchange for compassion? What would change? What would change in our interactions, our thoughts, and our conversations? Not just with the people who are lost, but with each other. What would change as we talk about the people hurting around us? I bet it would change our tone. (laughs) I bet we'd stop talking about those people and we'd start praying for them. Let's ask God to send workers into his harvest field and let's ask him to start with us.